Welcome, everybody. OK. I'd like to start this talk off by asking you some questions. How do you go about learning? How do you decide what actually works and what doesn't work when you're trying to build a system? If you're anything like me, I typically learn by when things go wrong, when there's some kind of failure. So it's only when I've really had to really feel the pain, the consequences of the decisions that I've taken, the ways that I've built systems, that you actually truly understand how your system works and the context for, for how things actually work under the covers. Now the theme of this conference is what things, how things work and what makes things work. This talk is going to take things a little bit from the other angle and is going to have a look at some of the things that haven't worked for clients that have tried to build cloud native architectures and have a look at how can we learn from that and see what are the sort of, uh, sort of principles and patterns we can take out of that to find out ways for building systems that do work. So a little bit about the, uh, the title, it's Journeys to Cloud Native Architecture, Sun, Sea and Emergencies. Now, in summertime, a lot of British folks often head off to sunnier climates like Spain in order to get some sunshine because it doesn't, it doesn't actually shine as much in the UK sometimes as it does in other countries. And often they have a great time when they go on holiday, but sometimes things go a little bit wrong and they land up maybe in hospital. And there is actually a documentary on British television which is literally called Sun, Sea and A&E, Accidents and Emergencies. And this, this documentary goes behind the scenes and it follows the medics that are in some of these sort of countries like Spain. And it, has a, it goes behind the scenes and it looks at the stories of some of these unfortunate tourists and what happens to them when they go on holiday. They want to go for sun and sea but actually they land up in hospital instead. And the analogy, if you will, is that uh, I work for a technology consultancy, so not a medical one. But we as hands-on hands consultants, we help clients to embark on building cloud native systems. And often we will guide and steer them right from day one. But sometimes we're also called in when things go a little bit wrong and when their projects haven't quite gone according to plan. So in this talk, we're also going to go behind the scenes and we're going to have a look at some of the stories of the clients that we've worked with and see what are the ch typical challenges that they faced and, that and, the, and the challenges that people often face when they're embarking on building new cloud native systems. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is uh, Nikki Watt. I'm the CTO at a company called Open Credo and we help companies to adapt and adopt emerging technologies to solve business problems. Our sort of focus area is very much on the cloud native and data engineering and machine learning space. And I've been involved with a few projects of building microservices and, and various serverless projects as well. And we've worked with a variety of clients on this. And that's why this talk is going to take all of the different learnings from those clients and distill it into some stories that I'm going to take you through to explain some of the, the concepts and the principles that we see having worked with them. So in terms of the agenda, we're going to start off with a little bit of an overview, set the scene. What is it that people think they're getting when they actually try to build a cloud native system? Then we're going to explore some of the typical issues and challenges that they face along the way. And then we're going to finish off with some principles for success that, that we see working quite well. So first of all, the dream. What do you think you're getting when you actually try to build a cloud native system? So I would say, why do you go on holiday in the first place? And you might say, well, you know, you picked up this brochure, there was this wall-to-wall -wall sunshine, um, maybe you saw there's some catered apartments, I can do some sort of takeaway or try something new like rock climbing. But I would say that's what you do when you go on holiday, that's not why you go on holiday. The reason why you go on holiday is because maybe it's been a really long year and you just need a break, maybe you want to spend more time with family and friends, or maybe you really are vitamin D deficient and you need some sunshine, which is also a possibility. And I'd argue it's the same thing when you're embarking on building uh, a new project and a cloud native project, which I'll explain what that is in the, future, uh, in the next few slides. But quite often we're approached by clients and we get asked, can you please help us to build a microservice project with DevOps pipelines and chaos engineering? And this is all very important stuff, but it's really the mechanics of building a system. There really, there should be a, a business driver behind that as to why you're actually building the system. And it's really important because that is going to impact uh, why and how you do things. So we typically see two main reasons for clients wanting to build cloud native systems. So the first one is because they want a faster time to market. So things like microservices, which are small and compact and they can get shipped out uh, more quickly and easily in front of clients, definitely is the tools and techniques that can help with that. 
Also, businesses are trying to kind of grow in scale, so maybe they're moving into different geographic regions or they're having to deal with sudden scale Black Friday and things like that, that Cyber Monday that they haven't had to before. Things like the elastic scaling components of um, the cloud and, and various technologies around that is a key factor for enabling that to happen. Now, cost can be a factor, but often it's not a driver for why people build these systems. It's generally for one of these two reasons. But it's really important to understand why and what your drivers are in the first place because that is going to impact the approach that you take, the tools that you choose, and uh, always sometimes forgotten, it's going to impact the people and the teams and the processes that, uh, that you engage in. And this is often a, uh, forgotten about, but it, it really is a, a key part. So if I was to describe what does it mean to go cloud native, there's a lot of definitions about what cloud native means. There's the CNCF definition. But I would say this is, a, this is about an approach to building applications where uh, your applications are capable of exploiting some of these good cloud-like qualities of scaling and the delivery techniques and tools. But really importantly, it's in order to meet the business objectives that you have. So. We're going to follow a few families as they go on a holiday, and they've checked in. Uh, they've, bought their air, they've bought their tickets, they're at the airport. They go to the lady behind the desk, they hand their passports in, and she has a look at them and she says, yeah, that's great, but I think you might be a little bit overweight. Um, and before we dive into the specific challenges that, that some of our clients face, it's worth pointing out that one of the fundamental underlying reasons for why people struggle with, with some of these um, uh, things we're going to talk about is that either consciously or unconsciously, they bring a lot of existing ways of thinking with them from past ways of, of, of building systems. And this can, uh, sometimes it can help, but sometimes it can also hinder. And the reality is that you've go, if you're going to build a cloud native system, it's going to need a completely different approach to uh, thinking about things, the tools that you use, and the skills that you're going to require. So our families, they've shared as much excess weight as possible. They've got their passes. They rush through to boarding. They check, do I have everything? I have my containers, tick. I have my orchestration engine, tick. Got a Kubernetes, microservices. I got 200 of those. DevOps, close enough. Um, and off they go. They arrive at their destination and all is well, until it's not. So this is where we're going to meet the first of our families, and I'm going to refer to them as the Joneses. They, this is fictional. It does not represent any specific client that we have. It is, um, uh, it, yeah, it's a fic it's, well, it is specific sets of clients, but it's no one particular client. Um, so they've decided they came for sun. The beach is what they want, so they head straight off there and put their sunlight, put the sort of um, their towel down, get on the beach, and all is well. Except their holiday doesn't really get much beyond day one because they get what I would call cloud native sunburn or trying to tackle too many things too quickly. So, quite often, in an effort to maximize the sun, you might want to see can I get all of my tanning in on day one? And you try and do that, but it's only really when you go home to your, uh, or go to your hotel room and you look in the mirror that you realize, actually, maybe I should have slowed down a little bit because this is, uh, I may have gone a little bit fast. And in the same way, when you're building a cloud native um, sort of application or a microservice type application, you can't expect to gain a fully well-rounded, reliable system overnight. This really is an evolutionary process and it's, you, you've got to build your way up towards it. It doesn't happen straight away. And often this is because for, for many clients, and this is very true of uh, more enterprise clients that are moving in towards the space, you're now having to marry a lot of different interrelated parts. So now you've got your application architecture, your operations, and your infrastructure that all need to work together to ultimately um, get to the goal that you're trying to get to. And what we typically um, sort of recommend to our clients is uh, to start off by building maybe one or two microservices in an MVP type fashion where you can really take it through the process, where you can build in the quality and understand what are the fundamental aspects of your platform that need to be solidified, things like logging and things like that, so that you can gain uh, quality in that rather than trying to, to start building your platform and all 50, 60 microservices at the same time. So, when this doesn't happen, so when, when we see clients going and they build the platform and they've got four or five parallel teams all starting to build a microservice at once, 
these are the typical observations that, that, that we see. So the first thing is that quality is compromised. So when you're, when you're trying to do so many things, your effort is going to be spread thin. So you, often what people will, will try and do is what is the, the sort of easiest thing they can do in order to make progress. But what happens is that the pain ultimately lands up getting delayed when you, when you take this approach because distributed systems are very hard. They're hard to get right, and if you, it's quite easy to ignore the difficult parts and just focus on the areas that, that you're most comfortable with. But you get lulled into this sort of false sense of security where you might have all of the technical pieces in place, but uh, it, it doesn't quite work correctly when you actually try and exercise things. So what does this actually look like? So we had uh, one um, enterprise client which was trying to move from a monolithic system to a microservices architecture. And they'd been going at it for a while, um, the pressure was building, and they were, the, approach, uh, the deadline was approaching for them. And they had brought all of their existing organizational structure with them. So they hadn't gone through any kind of digital, um, sorry, any kind of sort of organizational restructure, they still had relatively siloed teams. But they had done their research, they had looked, and they, said they understood what the technical components were that they, they required, and they brought that with them. And they tried to massage that pretty much around the existing processes that they had. And they did attempt to tackle about 40 or 50 microservices all at once. But the result was very much a system that was, uh, it had stability, resilience, and performance issues. And we were called in to have a, a review of the system and, and try and see maybe where, where, could, where were things going wrong, how could, how could we help them to sort of move forward. And one of the key issues that we found when, when we went in there was that um, they had only done what we call happy path testing. So they had no idea how their system actually behaved when, the, when, when things went wrong. So because they had primarily come from an application development uh, sort of background, they'd focused very much on the application testing, but they had ignored the platform testing. So what happened was that they had, they had some challenges and some of their uh, microservices were failing. And when they went to go and have a look at the logs to try and see what was going on, it actually turned out that half of their logs were missing. And this was because their logging system had back pressure, which it wasn't able to, to cope with. And because they hadn't tested the platform side of things, they had no idea they were even missing logs in the first place. So the fact that uh, you know, they missed this is uh, basically led to, to the, the point where they were hoping for this dream of a faster time to market. But this was far from reality. And what they actually landed up with was quite a risky and, and slow system, which was very difficult to debug and figure out what was going on. This was also further complicated by they had quite a few inconsistent environments strewn on the path up to production. So they were ultimately t um, targeting a Kubernetes setup, um, but because they had, uh, their infrastructure team was still relatively siloed, they were, they, were, they were not able to move fast enough to create these environments for the developers. So developers thought, this is okay, we still need to make progress, so we're going to just use Docker Compose and we'll get our systems to talk to each other that way. And they did, and they were very much able to, 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 to um, sort of figure out how the majority of the system needed to work. However, once they actually went into their first Kubernetes environment, suddenly the performance absolutely tanked. And it was about four times slower than when it was running on, uh, doc with just plain Docker Compose. And we were asked, well, what's wrong with Kubernetes? Is it not able to scale? What, 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 has, what has gone wrong? And in this case, it was very much uh, around the fact that they had a standard uh, sort of template that they had used to create their uh, Kubernetes pods. And they had a single value set for the CPU limit. And all of their pods basically hit this limit and it landed up um, throttling the system. But my point here is that it was only actually when everybody focused on bringing the application architecture, the operations, and the infrastructure together that you actually realize that you need all of these things to work together in order to make progress. So the prescription in this case is, uh, is relatively simple. And that is that sometimes you actually just have to slow down in order to go faster. Um, taking, focusing on quality and just picking one or two microservices and and uh, also focusing on the platform level concerns, making those stable will do wonders for you in the future because you'll be able to um, at least understand that you've got your logs, you've got distributed tracing, you've got some of the key fundamentals in, in place, and then you can start evolving that. It won't be perfect to begin with, but just starting with one or two is very important. 
So whilst our, the Joneses are taking some time out to sort of tend to their, their sunburn, we're going to have a look at family number two. And I'm going to refer to them as Deepak and friends. And whilst they like the sun, they prefer the sea. Um, they decide, we, we, you know, they've seen the waves, it looks pretty good. So they grab their surfboard, they head out over the first breaker, and uh, they're having a great time. Uh, and then they look back and they see, oh, I seem to be quite far away from where I started. Um, the shores, I started over there and I've, I've really kind of drifted. And they run into the second of, of the problems that, that we, we see quite often, and this is that they get caught in deep water, or they, have, they rely on a sort of surface level understanding of the system that they're trying to build. So you may be a really strong swimmer in your sort of home country, or maybe you're even a sort of a, an indoor champion, but the sea is quite a, different, quite a different beast. And so for example, I come from South Africa, and um, I'm very aware that there's certain tides and currents where if I swim in certain places, they will just wash me out to sea. So you really need to be aware of what are the safe places to play in and what are the, what are the areas you need to avoid. And this is the same when it comes to uh, the cloud native systems. You need to understand what are the safe places, what are some of the areas that, that you might want to try and ensure you avoid so you don't get your business washed out to sea. So as I've said before, uh, distributed systems are, are relatively hard to get right, and the devil is typically in the detail, and the detail really does matter. But with so many new sort of tools and approaches and frameworks out there, it's hard to know what is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Opinions abound, and good people are typically very hard to come by. Now, the reality is that most organizations are not going to be able to go out there and find some ex Google or Facebook engineers. Uh, you may be able to do that, but most people can't do that. And, but ideally, you really do need some level of expertise to help guide you as you're going on this journey. Otherwise, you do land up going down quite a few rabbit holes. But what this uh, ultimately means is that you need to retrain uh, some of your staff and uh, skill them up. And what we sometimes see happening is that if we go into a client, they may have sort of taken a sysadmin and they've sent them on a Kubernetes in 24 hours course, and then they are designated as the Kubernetes expert. And Kubernetes, uh, I'm picking on Kubernetes a little bit because a lot of our clients use that. Um, but it's difficult to get right. If you're trying to, to configure this system, it is not simple. And it takes a lot of understanding to, to get right. So one of the um, sort of remedies, or not remedies, one of the things that we do highly recommend to our clients is that if you can outsource this problem, do so. Kubernetes has got to the point where you can take advantage of things like EKS or AKS or GKE in the different clouds, where if you don't have a very strong operational capability, you don't have to worry about some of these challenges. You still need to understand things, but at least you can offload the operational burden for some of it. So outsourcing your commodity, outsourcing some of the commodity type things like managing a cube cluster is key so that you can actually focus on the business uh, at hand. In my experience, however, some of the most challenging sort of problems occur when things fall between the cracks. So often problems aren't neatly just in the application area or they're just in the infrastructure area. They're in some mishmash sort of uh, place in between. And if you only narrowly focus on one or two areas in isolation, it can be quite problematic because you miss out on optimizing for the bigger picture. So again, we had one client um, where they had some artificial boundaries in place between their infrastructure team and their DevOps team. Now, I know for many people, DevOps is not a team, but for, for many people, this, this is the case. But they had their, their infrastructure team had typically come from, a, it was an enterprise environment, so they were previously responsible for maintaining the data center, and it made a lot of logical sense, well then they should create the machines in the cloud. So they were given that responsibility. And the, Deve the DevOps team were given the responsibility for doing the CI CD pipeline and also creating the cube cluster and things like that. But when they actually came to, to do this together, the DevOps team found that actually, the infrastructure team was now holding them back because they had manual processes, and whilst they had automated up to that point, they couldn't actually create the boxes under the covers. And this was manual and time consuming, and it landed up in an endless sort of ticket hell of raising tickets in order to try and get things done. And each team was doing local optimization um, and learning independently, but what really was required is bringing these functions together to actually um, allow them to make progress. Then there's the other side of the coin, which uh, is sometimes happens when we see clients who try to enforce centralization. 
Now, I'm not saying centralization is bad. Uh, when it's done in the right place, this can be really good. So for example, there's certain platform level concerns like um, logging and monitoring and things like that where you really do want good standards and it's important to have that. But if you put centralization in the wrong place, you can inadvertently push a lot of problems all the way out into your, into your system and, and it would be quite pervasive. So another uh, example that I can cite in, in this particular case is, uh, again, we had a, a client that was looking to build a, a platform and they had a core team uh, who had a very noble goal that they wanted to make it quite easy for their development teams. They had a lot of outsourced uh, sort of teams. They wanted to make it really easy for them to build their microservices and deploy them. So they, uh, they created a system where they could generate a, a lot of the code, but they mandated a lot of shared libraries. So they shared libraries at the platform level, but also at the business logic level in terms of how microservices communicated with one another. And the reality is that they landed up uh, in a situation where they had extremely tightly coupled architecture. They were not actually able to release, um, system, uh, release their microservices independently. And that is because they'd centralized on essentially an anti-pattern in this case, and that is trying to share libraries instead of potentially just duplicating them. The developers were also really abstracted away from what was going on, so they just thought, well, I just need to write my logic, I put it in one place, and uh, everything will take care of itself. And they ran into the, the, the problem of the distributed systems fallacy where they didn't even realize that they were making network calls and that there were queues and things in the way. And the system was exceptionally um, sort of slow and, and problematic. So understanding where to draw this line uh, is, is really important and understanding to, that you need to optimize for the bigger, the bigger plan is key. And this will mean that you will have to change some of your, your, the teams and the processes that you do, bringing, bringing teams together that may have been separate, but also um, looking to devolve power uh, where, where required as well. So I could speak of uh, a few other war stories. I've already spoken about the sort of don't repeat yourself dependency hell. But the one that I, I would like to just mention is what I call the singularity fallacy. And this is where uh, uh, w you find people that um, or clients are, are testing just with one instance of their microservice. So sometimes uh, maybe in an effort to co uh, cut costs or save on costs, uh, people will say, well, I'm just going to test just with one instance. Um, and the system works really well. But as soon as you suddenly run with two instances or three instances, you might find that actually I'm pulling from a queue and suddenly I'm getting out of order messaging. And you would not pick that up if you were only running with one instance. So understanding that you're running in a distributed system, in a cloud native system, and actually testing with at least two instances or more can also allow you to catch many of these problems much earlier on than if you just tested with just a single instance. So uh, in terms of uh, sort of the prescription to help get uh, clients back to shore in this case is that um, you do need to gain some sort of basic skills and expertise to help you as you go on this journey. Um, you know, sometimes you, you've got to sort of hire people that may have uh, done this before. You can get consultants as well. But if you have, more often than not, you're going to have to train up uh, the, the people in your teams and you need to understand this is going to take time and it's not going to happen overnight. If you can make it somebody else's problem, go for it, because um, you will save yourself a lot of pain in the process. Ah, a lot of, you'll save yourself from a lot of pain in the, pro in, in the process. And learn by optimizing for the bigger picture. Don't just look at the individual pieces and try and optimize for them uh, in, uh, in isolation, because that also doesn't work. So uh, whilst our rescue helicopter heads off, and goes to pick up Deepak and friends over, over the sea, we're going to turn our attention to family number three. And I'll call them uh, Susie and Jacob. And they are more of an adventurous lot, and they've decided that actually I'm going to try something new. I'm going to do some rock climbing. So they head out, they begin their ascent. Unfortunately for them, they're halfway up their epic climb, and they realize, actually, I didn't quite bring the right kit, and uh, get stranded halfway up the mountain, can't go up, can't go down, and they get stuck between a rock and a hard place. And this is the equivalent of, of using uh, sort of ineffective tools and processes as you, uh, as you embark on this journey. So this is me uh, attempting to do some rock climbing in Spain, which was both a thrilling and a petrifying experience at the same time. I was very grateful for my experienced guide who uh, had a lot of patience. And when I asked for the hundredth time, is my not correct? Am I going to fall off the mountain? He was like, no, you will be all right. 
But a key takeaway for me as part of this is that it is really important to have the right equipment. So for example, if you're going to abseil into a canyon that's uh, 30 meters long, you don't want a 15 meter rope because whilst the second 15 meters will be very fast, it will also be very painful for you. And when it comes to uh, the cloud native world, the tools that you choose uh, will have a, a big impact on the success or not of your project. So um, if you're in startup land or you've got a completely greenfield um, scenario, this, is, this can be quite easy. Uh, not easy, it's easier. But more often than not, we see clients that are in the enterprise space and they have a lot of options to consider in terms of maybe bringing some of the tools with them. And if I'm just honest, I'd say some of the traditional tools, they actually just don't cut it nowadays. Um, there's, a, there's something called the sunk cost fallacy, uh, where you, you might see you go into a client and they've spent a lot of money on some kind of database or something like that. And there's a real desire to make use of that in the building of, of, of your new system. And it may be all right, but it may also cause problems for you. So the key point is that you need to choose your tools wisely because they're going to impact the journey. So, depending on you know, what kind of tools you choose, the mileage is going to vary. Some things will be uh, with mixed results. So some of the tools, if you get it a little bit wrong, it's just going to slow you down, you know, not too bad. Others will take you the long way around. Um, f others will actually really kind of hurt you. You want to avoid those. And then you've got some of them that will, uh, maybe they're more forward looking and allow you to progress um, into some of the interesting areas. So if we have a look at some of the tools that will maybe slow you down, the tools I would put, or the type of things I'd say is the unnecessarily heavy tooling. So this is typically where you are mandated that you need to use some kind of enterprise database that somebody has maybe spent a lot of money on. Um, it's not the end of the world, but it can, uh, it can be problematic. The one that I'd like to point out is actually base container images. So these are the container images that you use as a base for maybe building your microservices on and then deploying into, into your environments. And Sometimes uh, what we see is that there's a desire to have a, uh, a, a base image that is literally based on an entire operating system. So Red Hat as opposed to something like maybe Alpine Linux. And this comes from a misunderstanding of what the purpose of a base image is. So sometimes for um, sort of tradition, if, if people are thinking in still sort of traditional infrastructure terms, they will see a container just as a mini VM. And they will want to be able to spin this up. And if there's a problem with it, if there's a security patch, they want to make sure I've got a full on rel image that I can get myself in there and, and make sure that I can patch it. And there is, the sort of reality is that that's, nowadays it doesn't work that way. If, you, if you're actually going to, um, if you have a problem, you will just throw it away and you will build a new one. And Eleanor actually spoke, I think, in the security uh, track yesterday, or in her security talk yesterday, about this exact thing. That wi a while ago, people were mandating that they should be patching, and now they're actually saying, no, don't patch, just create a new one and, and, and move on from there. So this is not the end of the world, but it can slow you down. It's going to add to your network traffic for your developers, and you know, pulling down a four gigabyte image is, is unnecessary. Um, so ironically, it has a bigger attack surface as well. And it's a little bit like maybe you go climbing and you've got trainers instead of um, sort of proper rock climbing shoes. It's, you can get away with it, but it's, it's you know, a little bit slippery. Then you have tools that are going to take you the long way around. And I would put into this category what I call the DIY or the build your own uh, sort of category. And this is... Uh, so, for example, um, Kubernetes has come a long way, uh, and it's, it's a lot more advanced than it was. But a few years ago, uh, many people were building their own PaaS, and actually you still see people doing this uh, today. And I would argue if you're building your own PaaS, don't. Like, you really do. There, there are really good options out there. Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, various things that, that you can not have to spend your, your, your company's money on and take advantage of. But other ones that we see actually within the system itself are things like frameworks. So logging frameworks is, is a typical example that we see. And as an engineer myself, like I, I love building things and you, you love to think that actually I have this special problem and I need, a exact, I need something special. The open source uh, sort of tool is not going to do it for me. I'm going to build one myself. Um, and there's a real desire to do that, but the opportunity cost to your business of doing that is massive. 
because you are going to have to spend and your business will have to spend a lot of time maintaining your custom tool uh, rather than just taking advantage of an open source tool out there on the market. So we had an example where we went into a client, they had uh, some problems with, with their microservices and we were uh, trying to have a look at the logs and what was going on and it turned out they had their own logging system and their own tools and we spent a fair amount of time just trying to understand how to actually use their tool. And the, the, the tool, whilst it was, you know, it wasn't bad, it actually didn't have many of the basic uh, sort of functionality that the open source tools had and that normal uh, sort of anybody, if you were going in from the outside, would rely on to be able to help you to do this. So tools that will just downright hurt you in the long run, um, I'm not going to name and shame any of them, but I would say they more fall into having certain characteristics. And this is tools that maybe uh, they don't have an API, they aren't automatable, and they're what I call horizontally challenged. So sometimes this actually refers more to the workload that you're running, the horizontally uh, sort of challenged part, but it can also refer to the tools. So if you're abseiling down a canyon, and uh, you know it's 30 meters, and you've got your 15 meter rope, the best you can do when you get to the 15 meters is just hang on and hope that somebody's going to give you another rope and get you up, or you can get yourself up. And it's the same if you look at tools that are, are not able to be automated as part of your process. You might have your business that you know, you're trying to deal with Cyber Monday and absolutely scale up and release new things. But if you've got part of the process where you've got to click on portals somewhere and you've got a manual intervention, it's like hanging on at the end of, of that rope. And you hope your business is not going to fall off a cliff or that uh, a, a competitor will be able to get there before you. Then you have tools that are a little bit more forward-looking. And uh, again, you know, we could go into specific details, but again, a, a more a, a sort of paradigm that I think is really interesting is the shift of moving from an imperative set of tools to a declarative set. So this really helps to simplify thinking and, and the approach that people take, especially in terms of building infrastructure and uh, deploying uh, applications and things like that. And I think it was yesterday, I think Tilda actually, um, there was a, a talk on, I think it was declarative JavaScript, but she mentioned some of these typical things uh, around declarative programming where it, it's a lot easier to reason about things where you declare this is the state of the system that uh, I would like, and then the, the, the application or the framework will be able to look at reality and converge that for you. So specific examples in here, I would say are things like Terraform. So Terraform is a very good example of where you, you can declaratively define this is the infrastructure, the resources that I want in the cloud. It will then have a look at, at what's actually there in, in the cloud itself and it will say, oh, you need more machines and it will converge that for you. You don't have to imperatively say, spin the machine up, spin it down, now do this, now do that. Likewise, the Kubernetes is another example and uh, the final one that I would, I would mention is actually more a process called GitOps. So I'm not sure if, uh, if, if uh, how sort of familiar you are with this, but traditionally when um, people are deploying things into environments, you might, you might have a Jenkins pipeline or something like that, where you build your application, you then put it into your registry, you will then connect to your test system, you will deploy that into the test system, you will run your tests and et cetera, et cetera. With GitOps, this takes a slightly different approach where you say, well, actually, I'm going to define a registry of what are the versions of maybe the applications that I want deployed into the test system. So say I want version one of microservice A, version two of B, three of C, et cetera. And instead of um, letting Jenkins drive the, the pulling of the, the image and pushing it into the test system, you just update the version in your registry and you say, I want version four of the microservice. And then you allow your target system, quite often in this case, something like Kubernetes through the operator pattern, to be able to have a look at that and say, oh, I recognize I'm out of sync. I should actually have version two of, of, of the microservice instead of one. And it will take care of actually pulling the service and actually deploy it into the environment for you. And this helps to get around some of the challenges with uh, security as well in Jenkins. We have Jenkins being the, the place where all the passwords are to connect to every single possible system. GitOps reverses that and says actually allow the target system to be able to pull the information into it. So, um, you know, what tools should you use? Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's some guidance out there from the Cloud Native Foundation. They've got this little periodic table type thing of all the various uh, sort of tools. 
Um, it's, they've also got a trail map which uh, tries to help guide in terms of what are the typical types of things that you should be looking at. The trail map talks about the, the first three things are mandatory and everything else is optional. The first three being you need containers, you need CI, CD, and you need orchestration engine. In my experience, uh, item number four, which is actually observability and analysis, is also mandatory. Um, I just don't think you can actually have a system where you don't have decent observability and actually be able to manage it properly. So I would say you need to go up to number four. But, I mean, if it, often what is just required is, I would just say, a little bit of considered thought and pragmatism in this area. There's a lot of tools out there, and the CNCF recommendations are a good start. But as a general rule of thumb, I'd say if you look at tools that are automation, API, and horizontally uh, sort of scale friendly, that, uh, that will be really good. And beware of the sunk cost fallacy because it's one of the quickest ways to actually uh, sink a project sometimes. So Susie and Jacob, they've got their new kit. They're on their way down the mountain. Uh, we're now going to look at family number four. And they are uh, maybe more a little bit of adrenaline junkies. They've decided they're going to opt for some extreme sports and want to break, three, break free from the shackles of health and safety. So they decide they're going to do some buggy racing. So they ignore all the warning signs, they go on their, go on their journey, um, land up hitting a tree, and get a little bit of mud on their faces. And in the cloud native world, uh, this equates to ignoring security in one way or another as part of your project. So I think it's fair to say that enterprise security has not been able to keep up with the changes in, uh, in the sort of cloud native world. And um, there's a lot of different ways of, of doing things nowadays. So some of the traditional approaches can't be relied on anymore. So having sort of perimeter security thinking and uh, uh, maybe trying to replicate all of your networks that you have in your data center in the cloud uh, is often tried, but it actually doesn't work uh, all that well. Everything really needs to be untrusted by default. And security itself needs to be um, evolve and adapt in the same way that the applications do. So if your applications are coming and going, you also need your security to be more dynamic and disposable as well. So whilst it's true that security maybe hasn't kept up, you also can't just ignore it. Um, in the past, if there was a vulnerability in a server, uh, there was generally a, quite a formal process that the sysadmins would go in and they would patch it. But as I said before, that doesn't happen typically anymore. Whether you've got a feature request or whether you're trying to patch um, a security vulnerability, you will typically just um, build a new image and actually um, uh, roll that out. So the responsibility really has shifted left for security. And Eleanor also spoke about this in her talk about getting developers to take a bit more responsibility for uh, the security in the system. And I think, like it or not, security has shifted more into the, 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 the CI CD pipeline and into the, the DevOps sort of space. So the type of things that you probably want to sort of incorporate as part of this in a sort of DevSecOps approach is you can have your standard things like OWASP testing if, if you're on, um, uh, if you've got um, uh, HTTP sort of um, application, but also things like handling secrets and key management, making sure that you aren't hard coding passwords and there's proper ways to do that. But also, you know, scanning your containers as part of the, the process itself. So there are open source alternatives and, and things out there like Claire. There are various other commercial ones as well. But that will really help to build the security in as part and parcel of the, the process that you're, uh, you're shipping your code out to. Just as important as, as incorporating the, these kind of checks in the CI CD pipeline or your DevOps process is actually getting intelligent insight out as well. So the security guys um, are quite thin on the ground generally, so it's going to be nigh on impossible to get a, a genuine security person into every single team. So you've got to make it a little bit easier for them to try and understand how secure is your system and, and try and help them uh, sort of uh, be able to be confident that you've got you've taken care of some of these things so quite often in in some of the systems you'll find that there has to be some kind of security checkbox at the end and if you don't engage security early um, you will just delay pain for yourself right at the end so there are tools that you can use to kind of help uh, get some of these security insights out to your security team and CISO. There are general cloud tools like sort of Scout 2 and stuff like that. But there's also things like, for example, Aquasec have got um, some, uh, something called Cube Hunter. So this will go and it will have a look at your Kubernetes um, clusters and it will look for weaknesses in that. 
There's also Cube Bench, which will you can run against your Cube cluster, and it will have a look at the Sys bench, uh, benchmarks, and it will actually tell you where you're compliant and where you're not. And being able to give your CISO or your security teams uh, some reports will allow you to get your systems out faster if you're still having to struggle to get through that. So what you don't want to be is at this position. So this was Tesla in about, uh, I think it was February 2018. Um, they had a Kubernetes console which was not password protected. And they had a pod. And um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, these hackers managed to get in through a pod. And there were AWS credentials lying around. And they essentially used that to go and run up some crypto mining uh, uh, boxes elsewhere. And whilst I'd love to say that Tesla is our client, they're not. Um, but security is, uh, we land up doing security reviews as part of our microservice reviews that we do for clients. And security is often one of the areas that is really uh, neglected. An example uh, here is, uh, again, I'm going to use Kubernetes as, as, uh, as my sort of example. If you, if you wait until the end to turn R back on, on your security cluster, uh, on your Kubernetes cluster, you are storing up pain for yourself. So sometimes in an effort to make progress quickly, people will just, they will just put the, the, their microservices in and they'll leave the security, they'll leave the R back on the cluster until the end and then they start turning it on and then you realize that actually it's quite a pain to be able to retrofit that after the fact. So the, um, in terms of moving forward, um, shifting security to the left, making it the responsibility of developers to incorporate as part of your CI CD process and just the, your general health uh, security hygiene that you do when you're building applications is really key. Getting security insights out to the, the CISOs and the security teams will make your life easier so that you can get past that hurdle um, in the end. And engaging security early on is a, is, will be crucial to be able to making progress. So our final, um, our final family that or a person we're going to have a look at is um, Tandy. Now she's always had luck on her side and she's decided she doesn't need to take out uh, travel insurance and she's decided she's going to go skydiving. She has all the right equipment and unfortunately for her, sometimes bad stuff happens. Uh, for her, she was skydiving, her main parachute failed and uh, it wasn't looking good, but luckily for her, her reserve did deploy and she actually landed quite safely on the ground. Then as luck would have it, she was rejoicing that she, you know, she still had her life and she tripped over a tree and she broke her collarbone. And this is uh, key to um, uh, so, uh, you know, one of the not anticipating failure and really weird failures in distributed systems is one of the key contributors to what we see as our cloud native sort of tourist mishaps. Distributed systems can fail in the most spectacular and unexpected ways. As I said before, Testing is crucial, and this includes your red path testing, so both at the application and the platform level. But this is also not enough. Um, you generally need good insight into how the system is behaving in real time so that when things do go wrong that you're absolutely not expecting, you have a way to be able to interrogate the system and be able to figure out what these things are. So this is where you need, you need your basic sort of monitoring and alerting, but you need more than that. You need really good observability. And you need to give yourself the best sort of chance of figuring out what is actually going on and how can I remedy the situation without having uh, all of figured out what all of the test cases were beforehand. So this requires a cohesive view of your system. So not just the application logs, you've got to bring together things like the, the system itself, the nodes, what's happening on them, as well as the deployments that are taking place in order to give you a full picture of the, the, the spectrum of what's going on. So things like distributed tracing really help in this case. So things like Zipkin, Open Tracing API, and also even service meshes, things like Istio can, can make a big difference. So uh, another example that we had, uh, we had a client where uh, they had a, a lot of problems with uh, some performance on their uh, microservices and they were trying to figure out what was going on and all they had was the application logs and that was all that they were originally looking at. So they didn't have a way to be able to bring all of these things together and slice and dice the data to be able to observe what was going on across the system. So they were missing some crucial input and that was the fact that there were deployments going on and some of their microservices were actually going up and down at the same time. The Kubernetes nodes were also in the process of getting replaced and the fact that they didn't have all of this information in one place meant that they were flying slightly blind. 
So some of the tools that can really help in, in this uh, sort of space are things like honeycomb, um, uh, Humio, and, and various things where you can aggregate lots of different data in order to slice and dice and understand what's going on. But the key thing is that you cannot anticipate everything. You can't test for everything. You have to be able to build the ability to, to understand and react within your system. And then there's chaos engineering. So I would say before you go around killing uh, various systems, make sure that you've addressed the unnecessary chaos first. And what I mean by that is make sure that you have got um, an automated way to restore your system in the first place. It doesn't help if you, you, know, you go around and you, you, kill, you kill some of your services and you say, oh, yes, it's, 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 it's caused a problem. But then you don't have the automation to actually bring it back. Your customers and your, your development teams will be very unhappy with you. Another area which is actually forgotten about sometimes is that you may have the automation, but your organization may be set up in such a way that it's siloed and the process to actually release it is the one that causes problems. So you may be able to automate and then you need cab approval. And then you suddenly have to go through this manual process of trying to restore your, your system and something that you thought could come up technically in a few seconds lands up taking much longer because your organization was not adapted to be able to deal with this. So chaos engineering, there are, there's good open source alternatives, uh, there's good open source um, sort of kits out there, things like the, um, the chaos toolkit. There's also commercial products, Gremlin and the like that can help with this. And make sure that you optimize for recovery. And this is crucial. It really, as I say, it doesn't help if you can detect that things have gone wrong. Your customers will absolutely not care if you tell them, I've only got a 2% failure rate. What they will care about is actually, if the system goes down, do I, do I even notice it? But if it does, how quickly can you get it back for me? And that is what they're going to care about. So optimizing for recovery should be the key thing that, that you're trying to do as part of this. And automating that from end to end will, uh, will, will be crucial. So failure is a good thing. Um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I would say that failure is really only failure if you fail to learn from it. You can learn from all of these various um, uh, sort of stories, but also within your own organization when things go wrong, use that in order to improve the system. So finishing off, uh, going to just summarize some of the principles for success uh, that we've had a look at. So if you're going to go on this cloud native journey, uh, it's going to involve doing things differently. So you're going to need a different set of approaches, thinking, tools, and processes and skills. And be aware that all of these areas, are, you know, they're going to need fresh thinking, but also what is the business objective that you're trying to achieve and make sure that you optimize for that. You need to optimize for the bigger picture, and this needs a cohesive approach. You need to look at your application architecture, but also your operations as well as your infrastructure at the same time. In terms of uh, tips for having a smoother journey, don't try to take on too much too quickly. Focus on the quality and not the quantity. Don't forget things like your sort of red path testing, but likewise test your platform as well to make sure that when things go wrong, you are able to recognize that and, and deal with it. Make sure that you get enough expertise to journey safely. So this will help prevent you from going down uh, some of the unnecessary sort of rabbit holes. It takes time for people to learn. So if you're in a management position, make sure that you, you, you build this into, into your plan and offload as much as possible if you possibly can. Choose your tools wisely. They'll have a big impact on, 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 on how well you're going to kind of do. Beware of the sunk cost fallacy and uh, beware of the lure of the DIY, the DIY tools. Choosing things that are standard out there in the open source uh, community and, and, and on the cloud will make uh, things a lot easier for you. Engage, don't enrage security. So um, make sure you engage security earlier. So um, developers need to start taking a little bit more responsibility, I think, for many of the sort of security aspects and building that into their applications and the, the process itself. And for the security teams, make sure that you can get insights out as well in the forms of reports to help some of the security guys make sense of, of this new world and, and uh, that you are actually adhering to, to good security practices. And finally, make sure that you anticipate, you plan, and you, uh, you test for failure. So things will go wrong. I guarantee you they will go wrong. And what you, you don't want to be the source of chaos, but you want to expect it and be able to deal with it. 
And most importantly, make sure that you can recover uh, and you can recover quickly. And uh, yeah, that's uh, all for me. So uh, thank you very much.